Welcome back to the Sacred Acts podcast from the Unitarian Universalist Congregation of Cleveland. I'm Reverend Randy Partain. And I'm Dr. Ellen Georgia. So pleased to be here to get deeper into some questions about our, our spirituality and our spiritual practices. We're starting with some Ask Us Anything episodes, uh, hopefully leading into some opportunities to have conversations with many of you about your own spiritual practices, but we are getting things cranked up here by just being vulnerable and answering some questions, some today about our own spiritual practices and how our environment, like the the places, the geography where we find ourselves affects our sense of spirituality too. So are you ready to dive in, Alan? Absolutely. Uh, Some exciting questions today. Uh, maybe I'll start uh, with Peggy's question uh, and pose it for your response, uh, Randy, to start. Sure. Um, Peggy asks, now that you have spent your first winter in Northeast Ohio, tell us about your experience and having experienced a different change of season cycle than you were used to in the South, has it had an influence on your spiritual practice? Well, so both of us come from Southern environs, don't we? I for sure come from about as south in the continental U.S. as you can come. Yeah. So I I grew up in Florida. And um, one of the things that I have said in a few spaces is the experience of grade school. You know, you we had those bulletin boards on the hallway and they would have different things on the bulletin boards throughout the year. And there would be fall leaves you know, cardboard or or uh, construction paper colored leaves on the on the wall in different fall colors. and um, and then there would be some kind of snow scene for winter. That was not the experience out in the world. That was kind of a theoretical marking of the seasons. Out in the world, it was just maybe a little less humid and maybe a little bit cooler, but it wasn't like a a change of season the way that it is here. And so now it's a very visceral experience to go through summer, autumn, winter, spring, and to have there be a different physical environment that um, that I'm existing in. And so whereas I, I was 23 years in Houston, Texas, and there I said we had summer and almost summer, and then the occasional really, really devastating freeze that nobody was prepared for um, because the infrastructure is not is not designed to handle serious freezes in Houston, Texas. And so here it really is different to have a sense of rhythm that goes beyond just a, a I don't know, just looking at the calendar and saying, well, now now it's a little bit longer daylight or a little bit shorter daylight. So that has actually enhanced my spiritual practices in a way because there's a there's a sense of how I move through a season that gets to be more intentional. And if I'm if I'm conscious of how I move through a season, then that also informs how I move through a day. So for instance, if I know that I need to move through a season, and create spaces of um, stepping away and having time to myself or having time to to refuel because it's going to be a very busy season. We're getting ready to move into the fall season as we're recording this, and I'm just mindful that it's going to be a very busy time. It usually is. It's a, a great time for ministers to overfunction. And so I need to be intentional about how I plan the the refueling and where my spiritual practices need to be top priority through the season. But then that also informs how my day is, you know, what do I do during the course of a day that says, I'm going to take a few minutes at this point in the day to just have a, a conscious breath or two and celebrate the work that I'm doing or to, to prepare myself and center myself for the things that come next so that the rhythm of the day kind of matches the, the rhythm that I'll have for the season. So in that way, it has been very uh, meaningful to have this visceral experience of seasons. So uh, if, what, if what, I may, yeah, what I, like I, to, to break in a little bit, I wanted to actually draw us back just for a moment 
because uh, so I mean I did not spend 23 years in Houston but for us both to have come up in Florida though I will also note uh, our two areas of Florida were very different sure uh, that from my understanding of where you were um, and I only note that because if you have not been to Florida it's easy to miss the way in which you are somehow uh, traveling south to go north in Florida and once you end up in the southeastern especially part of the state you're really the culture and the kind of universe of that feels so much more like the Northeast, uh, except for the weather, vastly different weather, but, uh, but the, the cultural things. And so I want to acknowledge sort of those, those two differences, but your point about school representation of seasons uh, is to me something I've always thought about. And especially the construction paper kind of cliche fall leaves uh, are the ones that always stuck with me. Uh, and are important also because it was an early moment for me thinking about the experience of seasons of somebody becoming aware of the way in which somebody else was like, no, your way of seeing the world is wrong. Like, this is not correct. Hmm. This is what fall looks like. Fall doesn't, is not supposed to look like palm trees. And just as you said, you know, maybe a few days where the humidity is down. Um, though also the thing I wanted to to raise as a, another experience of the winter in Florida is uh, it is a season of safety uh, in terms of the hurricane season. Absolutely. Um, that is a big part of what winter feels like. Uh, and in terms of the school year, because of course we have a school year built around Midwestern farming cycles. We don't have a, a school year built around Florida hurricanes uh, seasons, but it works out that way where like that period from, let's say, November through March is sort of like generally you know, if you're going to have hurricane days, it's going to be in the early, early part of the school year or the very end of the school year. That's right. Um, but all that is to say, what I really appreciate about Peggy's question is to acknowledge the way in which those things are really potent parts of our spiritual experiences, because seasonality is so subtle. It's such a like, just very ever present part for most of our lives. It doesn't necessarily occur to us that we experience it in, in different ways and that different parts of the the world experiences the, you know those things in different ways and that the the seasonality around us uh, informs our own spiritual awareness of the world so i think our floridness here as two people making this uh, recording in cleveland ohio is not an accident like that's not that's not a small small deal so i i wanted to to note that um yeah did you feel uh, safer during the winter in florida as well did you have those hurricane experiences that i'm thinking of so the place where i grew up like in my earliest years was sugarcane country. And so um, the, the sugarcane, for those of you that have not been around sugarcane, the way that they harvest sugarcane is they burn the fields. And so for a portion of the year, usually around the early part of the year, like around February, they were burning sugarcane fields and ash would fall from the sky. And it actually is one of the reasons that we wound up moving uh, when I was getting ready to go into the eighth grade, because I wound up in the hospital with bronchial pneumonia. And part of it was because of the pollution in the air from the sugarcane fields. And it was kind of the last straw for my mother. And so we uh, we moved to a place where there was not quite so much sugarcane. Um, so that was a, an interesting agriculturally informed seasonality that was not at all safe. So my, my, the sister that I grew up with has asthma and that was exacerbated. I had breathing issues that were exacerbated from that. And so the, the large scale weather was one piece of it, but the agricultural practices created a different kind of rhythm that. You know, I, I have not really thought about it as whether there was a sense of safety during certain parts of the year or not, but there was a different kind of danger at different yeah. parts of the year. <laughs> Absolutely. No, and that I, I feel like that is, a, a, again, an important thing, you know, something that is, I which I think is wonderful and, and a really underappreciated part of, you know, the kind of Great Lakes Basin is this is not an area that has a great deal of natural threat in terms of natural disasters. This is not an earthquake zone. It's not a volcano zone. Again, earthquakes and those sorts of things you know we get blizzards and, and other kinds of things and of course our infrastructure can fail us at times but you know um for people living in the global south for people who are living in you know all these other parts of the world our spiritual practices are often linked to that that sense of sort of threat and uh, fear um that 
creates anxiety and creates a sense of, of uh, uh, maybe impermanence, uh, for example, um, and, and those, those other kinds of things. I have very strange internal associations around hotels and uh, weirdly like early morning breakfast spots because my, my family, we did not, uh, we did not vacation much. We didn't ne never had money for, for travel uh, mm -hmm. of, of the ordinary, you know, driving around or, or going to places. So anytime we were driving, it was because we were fleeing a hurricane and we were going to some days in off the highway and some actually, you know, maybe a part of the state uh, closer to, you know, like where Georgia and Florida meet or something. Cause that's where the um, nothing quite like when you're on a road trip where you have to keep your eye on the weather because you might have to go East <laughs> instead of, uh, you know, West because of how the storm is tracking that particular day. And, and you don't, you don't know where you're going to sleep the next night. Um, so, uh, so some of those experiences uh, by contrast to now be in Northeast Ohio where there is um uh, a tempo kind of seasonal tempo that that to me is both new but then also feels very um regular and um not as threatening i mean on a bad snow day at least for me i have the luxury of not having to go places necessarily like i don't i because i don't work in an outdoor field or or uh you know uh, obviously our you know ucc doesn't uh open if there's a, a, an unreasonable amount of snow on the ground or, or there's some kind of you know weather sort of event so it's really just a, a little pause and then of course snow always you know gets shoveled out of the way eventually um so those those never feel like threats to me in the way that some of those those experiences when i was growing up uh would have had so i i feel that a great deal in cleveland yeah there is a, a certain privilege to to our particular position and it, you name a really important thing about spiritual community and you know I, I think in a lot of places our church community our spiritual community whatever that looks like is the place where we take our anxiety and say what do i do with this and we we need some place for it to land in our personal spiritual practices there probably is a piece of that that helps our nervous system regulate you know and if if we have different kinds of anxieties in our environment then it's going to it's going to show up in the way that our spiritual practices serve us. If I might jump back actually to Peggy's question, because I didn't want to get too down in the, the existential dumps when it comes to the weather. The other side of this that I wanted to name, because I, I appreciate Peggy's question eliciting a thing I have an uncomfortable relationship with, uh, strangely, uh, as a, as a, an American uh, consumer, you know, in, in our consumer culture, which is, because I don't have this familiarity with the seasonal cycle as much, it's still really, I, I, I get to foster a really wonderful childlike wonder about it, which I deeply appreciate having like, you know, for the fireflies in the summer and the snowfall in the winter and the apple picking, like some of those things are really still very magical because I didn't have them forever. So like they're still kind of new, but then weirdly, um, and so I'm posing this, I'll, I'll just pose it as a question. Uh, Reverend Randy, do you find yourself uh similar to my experience struggling sometimes at the glee that comes when that seasonality is always wrapped up in stores and buying stuff and uh sometimes i just find myself wrestling between this is really joyful and wonderful but also why did i just spend a hundred dollars on candles at the white barn candle company so that my house smells like pumpkins or pine forest or whatever it was um and just sort of like acknowledging this way in which um th there's a commodification here but also there's joy in that and that is a spiritual uh, uh borderland that i sometimes inhabit and feel strange things about because it, it i never want to feel guilty about having joy but on the other hand you know sometimes i'm like why does joy cost so much yes yeah, there's a weird dichotomy. When we were children, my sister and I used to make Christmas tree ornaments and we would make these felt Christmas tree ornaments. It was one of the things we did around the holidays. We we were creative in the way that we did. My mom was really great about having craft kinds of things for us to do. And I'm sure it kept us busy and occupied and all of that stuff. But I don't have time now in most of my schedule for that kind of crafting the things that might make my environment more delightful. And so if I want those things around, 
I have to figure out a place to buy them and decide is the delight that I will experience from having this in my environment worth the price tag? And is that going to somehow tamp down the excitement and the enthusiasm because I have now spent so much money on creating a, a festive environment? The other thing, though, for me, I have learned in uh, in the last couple of years of winters in Ohio that my fingertips and toes will go numb in uh, not as cold weather as I would expect. The temperature can be a little higher than what I would think for my toes and my my fingertips to be um, unpleasantly affected. And so I have to prepare for going out to delight in some of the winter activities so that my body is still cared for in a way that will allow me to experience delight and not to, to suffer. And so there's a sense of wanting to embrace the delight and wanting to be out in the, in the new environment of this wintry landscape where it's visceral and meaningful and all of that, but also that I need to do some things differently to prepare for that so that when I arrive in those spaces, I, I can just we we talked about surrender last episode but i can be fully present and just surrender in that space without it doing me harm and so that's another piece of it that i find um it's different but it also means that i get to be intentional about how i do things yeah that 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 care for yourself uh, being so important because you raised that i i do want to note uh for, for peggy's question of course this is just for me uh, randy so feel free to to give a counterpoint here, but snowfall and in particular, like dramatic snowfall is, is for me the most seasonally noticeable. Thing. Like that is the thing. Like I didn't see snow for the first time until I was like 17 years old when I was going to college. So I, I was uh, not, that was, that was still a, an entirely new experience. And to the point of uh, care for self, you know, cause I, you know, a strange thing, uh, you know, in, in that experience was 17 years old at like a, Fort Lauderdale Burlington Coat Factory because I'd never owned a coat before. I'd never prepared for the out of doors and sort of getting getting those things together. But then uh, to be in it this time, I was living in in, in Indiana um, on you know sort of um, a neighborhood area that I had walked in a great deal, and to see the snowfall, uh, which is such a just dramatic and blanketing experience you know, of of winter, um, and specifically the way that it it rounded out all the sharp edges of the world in this transformation. Every roof was suddenly a little curve and every that jut in that broken part of the sidewalk that was, you know, whatever, at least from a distance looked like just a little slopey, slopey mound. And what I will say uh, very much to Peggy's question is that those, uh, when you do have the the privilege of coming from one place and finding another kind of place, as I'm sure it could go in, in either direction, um, is to is to realize how you can see the world differently because of the the particular seasons of 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 time that you're in and uh, snowfall in that sense uh, was a real kind of example of grace to me of what can happen when we live in a world where the sharp edges are worn a little round and are are not quite as sharp so uh, it's worth getting out there with our numb fingers and toes sometimes because it really is great to see a world from a different vantage. That's right. Yeah. Well, and and that kind of leads into another question from Valerie that really gets to the heart of why we wanted to to do this podcast anyway, um, to really talk about some specific spiritual practices. And maybe this has nothing to do with seasonality, but um, Valerie was asking us, which spiritual practices come to you easily? How do you decide which spiritual practices to pursue on a regular basis or at a particular time? And then are are any of your spiritual practices fun? You know, is there is there something that is, as you were talking about, delightful or fun about spiritual practices that we embrace? So what do you think? Are, are there some uh, spiritual practices that come easily to you? And how do you make decisions about which spiritual practices to engage in? I, I so appreciate this question from Valerie because it's not something that had occurred to me before to think about uh, sort of easily or not easily. And so maybe it's my own sort of feelings about the question, but I feel like uh, I am 
I am happy to own up to the fact that I am not good at these. Hmm. Like I'm not, it, as far as things coming easily or not easily, almost none of them are easy uh, for me. Now I hope perhaps maybe other people that's their experience as well, that this is sort of always uh, difficult or requires like a very, uh, you know, a, a great amount of effort and a great amount of attention, but maybe there's some spiritual practice savant out there who just falls into spirituality, like with, with absolute ease. But what I will say is that none of these for me are, are anything but hard won. And in my experience of life, as I've gotten older, so much is against my instincts to be spiritual in terms of where my attention goes, in terms of how my time is meant to be spent. Um, so even if the spiritual practices were coming easy, it would also still be hard because, you know, it's, uh, it's uh, uh, so much is, is, is going upstream to get to a, a spiritual place. Um, mm -hmm. So I would say that that none really come easily, but the other the other side to that to to Valerie's question is that it also means that the ones that I then pursue are ones that are are richly meaningful. Um, so what I don't have in my life is like a family structure that is so deeply entwined with a temple or a congregation or you know some place that has just always been the way that life has been led. I like when I read old, especially older historical accounts of people who just you know, have their, the religiosity is, is built into their lives. That feels very easy to me that you would just know that, you know, uh, once a week you, you go to confession or once a week you, you go to the, um, you know, you're in the, the, the shul and you're, you know, doing the, these things are just built into your, your day-to-day -day practices. So, so those, those things are almost never there. So if I'm ever doing it, it has to be really on purpose. That's, that's certainly my, my sense. Uh, but again, maybe there are others out there who, just fall right into this so easily and it's no, no problem for them at all. How about you, Reverend Randy? Well, there's a yes and to this. Um, I have a daily yoga practice. And by daily, I don't mean every single day, but I mean more days in a week than not. Uh, I engage in a, a yoga practice first thing in the morning. And it comes easily now because it is a habit. And it is something that I decide to put first thing in the morning. If I were to decide that it was going to be three o'clock in the afternoon, then it would not come easily at all because I've tried it at different times during the day. And the time that it is easy is if it's the first thing that I do in the morning and it sets me up for the day. One of the spiritual practices that I've taken up in the last few months has been more contemplative walks and they come easily but what also comes easily is not doing them because if uh, if there are other busy things happening in the evening, then it's easy for me to just say, this isn't that important. And it is absolutely that important. Um, and if I decide to do it, it's not a difficult thing for me to do. And once I'm in it, it's easy for me to be immersed in the uh, being present and looking for whatever nature has to communicate to me that day. But it's it's really easy to let other things just wash over that and, and deprioritize it. And then the other spiritual practice that I think about is I, I find a lot of spirituality in collaborative play. And so there, there's a lot of fun to be had in collaborative play. And I, I find that we learn lessons about ourselves and we and a lot of those lessons are transferable to other spaces. So um, there's, it's great fun to have those experiences, but what I find difficult is inviting other people to maybe have a, a debrief, you know, to, to think about what is it that we received from this? And so I'm, I'm learning for myself to take moments after those uh, those times of collaborative play and kind of think about the lessons to be introspective about those things, but also to invite other people to to have that as well. Not that that they have to have my experience, but it's really easy for me to feel like I'm imposing on other people and really that kind of defeats the some of the purpose some of the benefit at least so those are those are the things that come to mind i i'm getting better at the moment by moment introspection uh, i think that that that's becoming a habit 
Yeah. Are any of your spiritual practices fun? So, uh, uh, so the thing I would point to for fun uh, is, um, uh, and of course, I think anytime you're going to talk about fun in a spiritual practice setting, it's going to not seem that spiritual. So I'm very sort of aware of that. But one thing I will, will note is that I have never been cooking and it has not been a spiritual practice. Hmm. And I hope a decent amount of my cooking is fun. Um, I cook a great deal. I've always cooked. I've always seen, uh, like for me, food is, to your point about the natural world and how it shows up, you know, I, I my experience in the natural world that is most meaningful to me is often the kind that I get to incorporate into my own body like this that, that experience of you know crunchy vegetables and um you know particular you know animal products that i try to care about and be thoughtful about as i'm using them the, the the conscientiousness of all of those things sort of coming together and and of course the delight that is you know happens when you care about those things that are, that are sort of happening um but at this stage um you know with the unless i'm being very caring about it you know cooking is a daily activity that you just have to do no matter what so it's easy to fall out of the spirituality of that so a thing i have done more recently uh is i have started taking some mandolin lessons mm. and uh i note that here because um it would be really easy it is so easy now if you have not tried uh to learn an instrument in 2023 the amount of things on the internet that are there to help you do this Patreon accounts that you can get that will just have YouTube videos that are there that you can rewind and watch through for hours and hours on it. If, if all you are caring about is proficiency and efficiency in your knowledge gathering, there's no reason anymore to ever leave your room and you can just learn everything in this one place. But instead, what I have done is I, I've connected with a teacher and I go to a place where most of my fellow students are between six and 12 years old. And they all have their piano books with them. Wow. And uh, it's a very, you know, like there's always like a kid's drum set in the corner of this room. Um, and it is a venue to, um, I, I'm, I'm glad to say, because I have no aspirations to like record. Like I'm, this is not, my lessons are not because I'm going to, I have this, you know, this great career ahead of me. This is, is all for my own edification. Um, but the, the chance to put yourself in that role of a student of a particularly elementary kind of student. Um, it's that that uh, that Buddhist idea of the beginner's mind, mm -hmm. of inhabiting that space of not assuming that you know what the world is and what its shape is. And I get to sit in front of a teacher who's much better at these stringed instruments than I am. And I get to just sort of be in wonder and learn this fingering and uh, this chord shape that's like, oh my gosh, I've never played a diminished seventh chord this far up the fretboard before and like where, where where's my finger supposed to go um so these things are are um are uh, i have no idea if i'm making good or bad progress on the mandolin but i'm making very good progress when it comes to uh not taking myself so seriously that i don't think i could learn something starting from the basics and so that oh, for sure you're you're already talking about diminished seventh chords, so you're beyond the basics. Uh, well, and what this is also what's great about a teacher too is that a teacher will, a good teacher will, will stretch you. And uh, you know, so I explained that I was uh, lived in New York, and we started talking because I guess uh, my teacher's daughter lives in New York, and uh, suddenly we were talking about Duke Ellington, and we were trying to learn take the A train, which uh, you can't avoid those diminished sevenths when you're playing. Uh, when you're playing the you know jazz from the 30s and 40s so yeah. uh so yeah this is all all great stretching though and uh so i want to say it's not the mandolin part that is the spiritual practice it's the learning posture and am i understanding you correctly that there are younger students in the space while you are also in the space yes absolutely i, I sometimes sit on a bench next to you know like waiting for the time to get her there's like a room that isn't quite available yet or something and i'm sitting next to you know young piano student i know this isn't the purpose of your presence there but what an amazing opportunity to just model that um that learning and that that beginner's mind for people that may not realize that you're modeling something for them but here they see an adult human being doing the same thing that they are doing and continuing to learn and continuing to grow and 
there is so much of us as adults that wants to be perfect. I know for me, learning a new thing, the the so biggest that, challenge there is wanting to be perfect right out of the gate and not giving myself grace to actually do something poorly until I'm able to do it well. And so I think that the more we can be visible in our our ungraceful learning times, um, the more grace we can give to one another and to ourselves to um, to keep growing and to keep doing new things. So I think it's there's an amazing complement to your growth that that might be happening in that. I like to imagine that it's happening yeah. in this space. <laughs> no, of course, and 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 to me, what you're naming here is also what spirituality always grants to us. In uh, that's one of the reasons I always find spiritual work to be so worthy is because uh, it's rare that you get to find ways to spend your time that I know, like in the experience that I know are innately good for me and innately good for the world. Because for me to engage in the world in this way is often the best version of myself. And that's, you know, it's, it's the, the mutuality of that is uh, to me, part of what makes a spiritual point of view about some of the things that we're up to um, so meaningful. It it uh, it does lead me to think uh, and wanted to share um, a, a more serious practice that I've been working on. I've actually been praying more lately, mm. and I feel weird sharing that. So I'm trying to share it more. So that's that's like a spiritual instinct I have. If I feel weird and uncomfortable, I'm trying to lean into the vulnerability of that. Yeah, and I can name that too because prayer has always been this weird fraught thing in the world, and I've definitely have spent a lot of time in spaces where prayer has been used as a tool of manipulation and uh, a very inauthentic way to say what God is saying to other people and and many sort of things like that. I've always had a, a real aversion to the um the pieties that often get get attached to God in in our discourse in, in sort of, you know, again America in 2023. Mm. Um so uh so trying to be more thoughtful about this, um a practice that's become very meaningful um was was informed by I have a good friend who is a Catholic theologian. Actually he's he's uh a Trinitarian theologian in particular. So again, a fraught, fraught topic to bring up in, in UU spaces. But uh, we, I know we're going to talk about the Trinity later on, actually, in our podcast discussion. So we'll, it'll come up again. We do have a question about <laughs> exactly. that. Very interesting one. Okay. Yeah. But all that is to say, so, uh, but one of the things that we were talking about, and, and he was talking about some of his own sort of feelings about how to frame our experience. And, and the phrase that he used that's really stuck with me is um, the phrase that God is not elsewhere. And to me, thinking of, you know, uh, the experience I was just sharing about how spirituality is this mutually beneficial thing um, and trying to develop a prayerful practice that was actually meaningful and not, again, this sort of pietistic thing. Um, there's an old Eastern Orthodox prayer practice, um, um, sometimes it's called the Jesus Prayer. It's like a prayer beat. It's more like a mantra prayer. It's framed as like a classic uh, Kyrie liaison style sort of thing. So it's just, Lord Jesus, Son of God, have mercy on me, a sinner though you can leave out parts of that if you get into the mantra. So you don't necessarily mm -hmm. have to do the whole thing, but make no mistake that a sinner part is, is, is when I, I still think about and struggle with my own sense of what that might mean for me. But of course the idea is that again, you're falling into this mantra and you're um, again, using prayer beads to kind of continue yourself through it. Um, but I'm not Eastern Orthodox, despite loving a great deal about Eastern Orthodox spirituality. Um, my experience of God is not as esoteric and, you know, in Eastern Orthodox thinking, this prayer practice is meant to sort of empty yourself. Um, it's very much a, 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 a way to fall into a mantra that, that focuses your attention outside of yourself and, and you sort of fall away. Sure. Um, and all I can say is that, yes, that, that part is, is one that I still haven't found as meaningful. But because my friend told me that God isn't elsewhere, what I have found myself doing is saying this prayer often when I am in a large public places mm. and I have started saying this prayer while intentionally looking at many of the people who I don't know who are around me and giving frame to this in a way that invites me to see God, which, you know, in the, the theology around Jesus and the incarnation is this, this somehow both and humanness and divinity co coexisting in one, one place and uh maybe I, like I, I i hope it isn't a creepy thing to think uh that i'm looking at all these people and imagining god in their face 
but what it has actually made me realize is like, oh, I don't I actually don't look at enough faces. I don't take seriously enough um, in a world where faces are constantly being shouted at me from TV and the internet and advertisements and magazines and every other thing um, mm-hmm. to, to be in a space and to, um, to fall into that. And I'll, I, I want to raise that uh, to, to Valerie's question because it is the kind of thing that has reshaped my experience and then also my experience of, of other people. So while I do try to take spirituality, uh, while I try to still have joyful and fun things in my life that are spiritually meaningful, uh, the the growth edge for me in a spiritual practice is often finding that place where the most vulnerable parts of myself are in conversation with the most authentic parts of the wider world and finding a way to put those things in, into, into play. So for now, this has become a meaningful, meaningful thing to me. Randy, I'm curious if you have... Uh, maybe a less fun, but still a um, uh, specific practice that you might uh, you might share. Well, one of the things that I have been exploring more recently is parts work. And I, I feel like we have already been talking for a while. And so I don't want to get into a, a technical definition of, of all of that just, just here and now, maybe there'll, there'll be space in another episode for it. But one of the things that I, realize is that most of the things that I do that I'm not proud of, most of the things that I do that are not in alignment with my deepest values are because a part of me is trying to protect me. And it has really transformed the way that I look at other people and have a deeper compassion and a a deeper sense of their own vulnerability when I see somebody behaving in a way or when I experience somebody behaving in a way that is challenging or confrontational or what have you, there, there is a, a piece of me now that is able to look at that and say some part of them is feeling really protective right now and there is something really, um, really scary about what's happening in their in their mental space or in even in their physical space right now. And so um, not quite the same as looking more deeply at faces, but just looking at, at human beings and realizing that I am more than whatever part of me is being reactive in a given moment. And so is everybody else. So the, the person that I am experiencing, I'm really experiencing a piece of that person and not the totality of who they are all the time. And so I think that is a spiritual practice that that choosing to to see people to experience people through that filter of awareness that there there is some part of them that is feeling protective right now and to give myself permission to to take a step back and say there is some part of me that is feeling really protective right now when I have, you know, uh, raised my voice in a way that I didn't really need to, or snapped back at somebody in a way that I really didn't need to, um, or kept my mouth shut at a time when I really could have said something. Uh, you know, those, those all are true of me at one time or another, but maybe there'll be another opportunity. You said something about sin that I I might throw in another ask us anything before we get into other people's spiritual practices, because I think there's just, there's so much of us that is afraid to admit that we're imperfect <laughs> and I, that we miss the mark, you know? I so feel that. And it's one of the reasons why I, I raised that is to note that that is a term and, and, and not because, uh, you know, sin is, is one thing, but sinner. Uh, to like that this isn't the you know this is the substantive of you know a person who does sin you know like that so so for me those questions are are very uh, important ones to ask because if our spirituality isn't you know as you just noted before you know we we are not like our our whole person is not the the feelings that we're having at any one moment in a similar way we are not the same thing as bad things that we have done but we're also not seeing ourselves clearly if we're not cognizant of our ability to, uh, as you said, miss the mark um, in these ways and coming up with a way to talk about that, for me, I know is is uh, spiritually authentic to to be in conversation with those things. Because uh, as I was just saying before, if God truly is everywhere, then 
or, or I'm sorry, if God isn't elsewhere, then that also means that there, the, that spiritual richness, that, that, that part of that is in even those times that I'm not doing, um, not being the, the, the version of myself I, I would like to be. So we should talk about that. I think that's the whole point of spiritual practices is to, to remind us that we have imperfections and that it's very human and natural and normal. And there's nothing wrong with us having imperfections, but also that we have this aspiration to, to live into these deep values that are really meaningful to us. And that even though we're not going to get it right, that doesn't mean we shouldn't keep trying. And so that reorientation and that calling ourselves back again and again and again to this is who I really want to be in the world. And I can, I can do it in a way that's intentional and mindful, you know, though, without the spiritual practices, it's just um, an empty ideal almost, but the spiritual practices are the way that we remind ourselves and call ourselves back and recenter and reground and, and give it another try. You know, today I get to do it in a way that I've never done it before. And I might not have done it great yesterday, but today is different. And it's, it's a never ending journey, which is kind of frustrating, but <laughs> the, to me, the, the whole point of the spiritual practices is to, to keep us fueled for the next leg of that journey. So that seems like enough for, for plenty, today. We've got, we've still got more some, to come. Yes. We've got some great questions. Um, so, uh, for now I will just say, uh, Please keep listening and uh, I'm grateful that you were here today. Create something beautiful today. And thank you so much. We'll see you next time.